Okay, welcome everybody to uh, this event. My name is Alex Dukalski. I am the director of the UCD Center for Asia Pacific Research and an associate professor in the School of Political uh, Politics and International Relations at UCD. Uh, the UCD Center for Asia Pacific Research is an interdisciplinary hub for Asia Pacific research uh, at, uh, among academics at UCD, particularly in the colleges of social science and law and arts and humanities. Uh, if you are so inclined, you can follow us on Twitter at Asia UCD. Uh, today, we are very lucky to have three journalists with uh, Irish roots and connections who have spent their careers reporting on major developments in and about Asia. Uh, we have with us today Finbar Birmingham, who reports on Europe-China relations for the South China Morning Post. Uh, after about 10 years on the trade beat in London and Hong Kong, uh, he now has a, a really unique profile in covering uh, China in Europe uh, for the South China Morning Post. Uh, and he also has a podcast uh, called the China Geopolitics Podcast. We have as well Yvonne Murray. Uh, Yvonne reported for RTE News and Channel 4 News on Chinese affairs from Beijing from 2018 to 2021. Uh, she then reported from Taiwan for a year and is now reporting for RTE uh, and current affairs from New York. Uh, finally, we have David McNeil. David teaches communications at the University of the Sacred Hearts in Tokyo, Japan. He's been writing for the Irish Times for uh, on Japanese affairs for about uh, 20 years. Uh, and previously, uh, he was correspondent for The Economist, The Independent, and The Chronicle of Higher Education. So I've given our guests uh, three questions to kind of frame the discussion. Uh, and they're each going to talk for about seven or eight minutes uh, about, you know, speak to those questions, uh, followed by plenty of time for questions and answers. If you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A uh, section and I will I will then manage them uh, and we will be done we'll, we'll wrap up at uh, 2 p.m. Right. Uh, the three questions I gave our three guests um, that they can take kind of any direction they want uh, one is what was your own pathway into becoming a journalist and reporting from or about uh, Asian affairs the second is what is a story in the last couple of years that you've either been most proud of or has taken up a lot of your focus uh, and to maybe give us a little bit of a behind the scenes glimpse into whatever that story is. And third, a more general question, I've asked our guests to talk about the main threats they see to Irish or European foreign correspondents in Asia and the main issue gaps that they uh, would like to see filled for, um, for readers uh, sitting here in, in Ireland or Europe um, about Asia. Uh, so with that, uh, I will hand it over. Uh, we've agreed that uh, Finbar will go first, followed by Ivan, followed by David. So Finbar, over to you. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for inviting me to, to speak today with a couple of great guests. Uh, it's a great honor and thanks to everybody for joining. Um, I'll just take these questions as they, as they, they came. Um, first one about my own journey into being a, a journalist reporting on, on Asia. I guess it really can be divided into two serendipitous uh, stints, uh, one of which was um, I spent my early uh, career being a music journalist in Scotland. Uh, it was great fun. Uh, it wasn't making very much money, but I got to interview some of my favorite bands and everything. But after doing this for a few years, I thought, right, I need to sort of make this work as a career. So I went back to university and did a postgraduate diploma in magazine journalism in Brighton. And that was around the time that the arse fell out of the world economy um, in 2008. And I graduated basically at a time when the, the UK, the Irish, the European economy was in a total mess and there weren't any jobs. And at this point, I had a friend who was teaching English in South Korea and saving money and, and having a great time. And, and she said, well, why don't you try that out? And I thought, OK, well, I'm not doing much else, so I may as well. So I ended up living in the southwest Korean city of Gwangju, which is a... Um, the cradle of democracy in South Korea, the breadbasket of the country, ostensibly um, teaching English. And I'm hoping now that there's still some Korean kids running around with Fermanagh accents. Um, but at that point, I managed to uh, wangle my way onto local radio, um, English language radio. I managed to, to get some reported gigs for Irish media in while I was living in, in Korea. 
And I came back after a year living in, in Korea to London with a, just a bit of a better CV. I had sort of uh, broadened away from arts and culture to writing about um, North Korean attacks on, on South Korean islands, um, reporting on the Korean Grand Prix, which was an absolute mess. I don't know if anybody recalls that. Um, and and like random stuff like the discovery of a Koreanosaurus dinosaur near my my hometown of uh, of Gwangju. So bits and pieces like that. Um, and and I came back and then started working in, in business journalism in in um, in London. And I, I think like having that bit of, of world experience living in Asia at that point was was really helpful. I spent a few years living in in London, working covering trade and economics. Uh, for various publications, uh, at one point, my an, a former editor of a magazine called Global Trade Review, which I'd worked as a correspondent and subsequently left, asked me would I be interested in returning um, to Asia to work as the Asia editor based out of Hong Kong. And again, at that point, I thought, why not? Uh, I had never been to Hong Kong, but I'd had a great time in Asia before. So there was no connection between the first stint I had and, and the second stint. I moved in, at the end of 2014 to Hong Kong had seven fantastic years, the first four of which I was the Asia editor of this magazine, um, reporting on trade policy, trade talks, uh, trade negotiations, uh, trade finance, commodity fraud, all this sort of good stuff out of, out of Hong Kong, flying around the region into mainland China, into India, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, et cetera. So I had a really good, fantastic experience. Um, and then Donald Trump came to power uh, and I had this very, unusual skill set of, of uh, being a, a, a journalist in Asia who had focused predominantly on global trade for the past few years. And with him starting a trade war, uh, the national newspaper of Hong Kong, uh, South China Morning Post, the editor I, who had met in an event, asked me uh, would I be interested in joining and uh, helping to launch their uh, political economy desk, which I did. Um, again, so, so a lot of ser serendipity involved there. There was no real great grand plan. Uh, after a few years doing that job and reporting on Trump's tariffs and stuff like that on the Chinese economy, um, I moved back to Europe last year uh, to be the Europe correspondent. Uh, so I'm now based in Brussels, where I am today, and I report largely on Europe-China relations, uh, which is a really dynamic, interesting beat. There's only a couple of journalists who are focused on this, so it's sort of like... Uh, you know, there's a lot of stories to be written and there are very few people doing them. So it's it's sort of quite quite a good beat to get scoops and exclusives. There's, you know, it's 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 a really interesting uh, job. Um, and so I, you know, maintained one foot in Asia working for, for a Hong Kong newspaper still and still, you know, writing about China, albeit its relationship with with Europe from from outside of China, like home, a whole lot of, of other journalists these days, I think there's more journalists writing about China outside China than there is inside China, unfortunately, these days. Um, on the second point about the uh, stories over the past few years, which I've been proud of, um, I think, I mean, lately, the last couple of years, I've been focused on dip diplomacy um, and human rights uh, out of Brussels, and I've been following very closely the issue related to Xinjiang. Um, we've uh, been involved. I've been involved personally in a couple of really big in-depth investigations that we did in Hong Kong and I've continued that work here. It's become a really resonant issue in Europe uh, when it comes to China. Uh, it's almost like a, a trigger word. Uh, the moment you, you mentioned Xinjiang, people in Ireland, I think now that previously weren't talking about that or had no awareness of where Xinjiang was or who Uyghurs were are now very much aware of it and really proud of some of the stories that I've managed to be involved in on that. Um, in one instance, we um, my background as a trade journalist comes in very handy in this because I, I tend to fetishize Chinese custom stats more than most. Every month on the 20th, I get my calculator out and I sit over and pour over these lines of customs data. And that has led to some really good stories, um, tracing goods in and out of China, um, in and out of Xinjiang. In one instance, we uncovered an entire supply chain of American harvesters made by John Deere being used to harvest cotton uh, by companies linked with, with forced labor in, in China. Um, and that turned into a pretty big scoop, which we were really happy with. Um, the, the, the sales of these goods had obviously been banned by the United States government because of their very hardline approach to, to Xinjiang. The second of which we traced uh, this like quite obscure byproduct of Finnish forestry uh, produce called chemical wood pulp from uh, the forests of, of northern Finland to 
uh, factories in Xinjiang just a stone's throw away from, from these uh, detention camps. Um, and the day after we published our story, the big uh, Swedish paper and pulp giant uh, store ends announced that it was going to leave the, the market altogether. So I think those are the, the issues that, that I've really been happy to trace um, and to, to track over the last few years. They've been a big part of my current beat in terms of U Europe-China relations. And, you know, it's been a way that I've been able to draw on my own previous uh, background covering trade and, and supply chains and, and bring that into my new beat. Um, and just to finish up on the final one about the threats to Irish European foreign correspondents in Asia, I mean, I think like we all face the same threats with regard what's happening around the world. We see a real de democracy deficit. Um, we see a real crackdown on, on journalists not just in China, but especially in China, but also in Southeast Asia, in Hong Kong, we're all working for the Hong Kong National Newspaper and we're all wondering where's the axe gonna fall next? I mean, nobody feels especially safe and I don't mean I'm, I'm physically safe, I'm ensconced here in Brussels, but you know, there are colleagues of mine who I would worry about. Um, I think that this threat of, um, you know, the use of, of government force to, to restrict journalists and what they can do is, very much the defining issue uh, when it comes to, to sort of Asian journalism these days. Um, you know, as I said at the start of this, there are more journalists outside China than inside covering um, covering China. And that will be the case, I think, in the future with Hong Kong as well. You're starting to see a lot of bureau, the New York Times moved their bureau to Seoul. Um, I know a lot of journalists who have relocated from Hong Kong to Singapore and Taiwan, et cetera. Um, in the case of Taiwan, it might be like going from the fire to the frying pan, but we, we'll, we'll see about that. Um, and in terms of like um, what I would like to see more of, I mean, generally, I think public, uh, there's, there's me and another guy, Stuart Lau, who people tuning into this probably know well, are the only two people in um, Brussels who, and in Belgium who cover Europe-China relations. There's somebody else in, the, in London for the Financial Times now, thank God. Um, there are people in Berlin covering it in German, but I think that there's so much to be written that isn't being written. And part of this is because publications don't have the budgets to commission people to do this. They have a sort of meager, uh, <laughs> meager pool of cash to work with. And I suppose their immediate priorities are not to get people to write about Asia. But uh, I mean, from my point of view, I think particularly the story of the likes of China and India is only going to become bigger and bigger and bigger as the years go on. And the fewer people we have writing about that, whereas it may be great for me because there's so much news that I can report, it's unhealthy for our societies to, to know so little about not just what's happening there, but what the effect these countries are having in Europe and the work that's, you know, going that we, the stuff that's happening that we, we don't hear about because there's just not enough journalists covering it. So, I mean, I guess that's an existential worry for the for the industry. We're all, uh, you know, fully aware of the fact that journalists are under financial pressure, media are suffering. I don't think that's going to necessarily improve. But personally, I think every country in Europe has a really interesting uh, story to tell, stories to tell about what's going on with their relations with Asia and China. I think it's a shame that there are so few people covering it. Um, advice to people who want to cover Asia, though, is I guess go there. I mean, that's the first thing you should definitely do. I'm, it's all well and good me talking about covering Asia from Europe, but 100% anybody who wants to get involved in, in covering such a, a fantastic dynamic place should boots on the ground. I mean, that's first things first, go over there, get a bit of experience, uh, learn a little bit about how different countries work. And, you know, I'm rambling, Alex, so I'll hand, <laughs> hand the mic over to you. Thank you. Okay. Great. No, perfect. These are these are really uh, uh, great reflections, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk more about them uh, in, in the Q&A. Uh, but for now, we'll hand over to Yvonne. Thanks, Alex. And um, it really is a pleasure to be here today um, in such esteemed company. And thank you for inviting me. A really uh, fascinating listening to Finbar there really resonates with my feelings um, about trying to cover the region and firstly to tackle the first question about how I got into Asian journalism, I wish I could say that it was all planned out from uh, you know, being uh, at school or university. It really wasn't at all. It was very haphazard. Um, I actually studied European studies at university and my focus was very Eurocentric. 
centric. Um, I studied French and German, so I was really, you know, as far as I was concerned, heading to Europe. Um, and also just in terms of my knowledge of Asia at that point in my life was minuscule. Um, I then went on to, to do a postgrad in history of international relations, and that's when I first began to learn about Asia, and it opened up a whole new sphere of, of, of knowledge. Um, and it made me realize that growing up in Ireland, we don't cover Asia, we don't talk about it, it's almost like it doesn't exist. So that was very eye-opening to me. On the course I was, I was on in London, there were lots of American students. They had much greater knowledge of Asia because it's much more real to them, um, that the, the history is, is much more intertwined. So um, and in terms of how I ended up covering the region uh, physically being out there, again, it was haphazard. Uh, my husband is with the BBC. He was posted to South Korea. First of all, so really interesting. I didn't know, Pimbar, that you were in Korea before, so we should have a chat about that at some point. What an amazing country. Um, and we were there for a year, um, came back to London, and then he again got this posting to, to China. I was also working with the BBC at the time, went out to China with him, and uh, I said to the BBC, I want to carry on working uh, for the BBC in China as well. They refused because of visa issues and because they're not very imaginative. Um, so I ended up quitting the BBC and uh, I eventually approached RTE to reopen the RTE Bureau there. So in fact, it actually worked out really well, but I was very disappointed with the BBC at the time, I have to say. Um, in terms of the, uh, so the route there, yes, it wasn't at all planned. Having said that, once I got to Asia, my, um, I felt embarrassed at how little I knew about it because Asia is just extraordinary. Korea is an incredible country uh, unto itself. Uh, Japan, where, where, where David is. I mean, the, the history of all of these places is, is utterly fascinating. It's something, as I said, we don't learn about. And then to get to China, which is, some, which is a country that, whether we like it or not, is going to have an impact on our futures. And begin to dig under the surface of what it is that makes uh, people think uh, how do people approach geopolitics there? How do they feel about their own politics? Um, th this was really eye-opening to me, and I, I found it um, essential to, to try to understand. Um, in terms of the stories that I feel proudest of in my China coverage, I think I would have to choose Xinjiang as well, like Finbar. I think um, this was a story that was extremely hard to cover from the ground. Um, many journalists did, though, very successfully. So uh, I went quite late in the day comparatively to some of the other people who were covering it. I went to Kashgar in 2020, just after, after the pandemic. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen the propaganda videos that, that, uh, you know, that the Chinese state media likes to put out. But there's one in particular that you may have seen on Twitter for these two young Uyghur girls who who talk about how, it, how the foreign media has made up lies about Xinjiang and how it is a beautiful place, um, full of beautiful women, by the way, is one of their key messages, which is an extraordinarily misogynistic approach. And, uh, and they, one of the phrases they like to use is, hearing is fictitious, seeing is believing. And I have to agree with them because I went and I saw, and I saw the scale of the, the internment camps, which is something you couldn't imagine if you had not stood in their shadows. Um, I saw the, 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 the palpable fear in, the, in people's faces as, as I approached them, before I even spoke to them. I felt the, the atmosphere of utter terror amongst the people there. Um, and it was an extremely frustrating trip because I couldn't interview anybody, because I knew that as soon as I addressed somebody, that they would be under scrutiny from the authorities there. And I could get back on the plane to Beijing. They couldn't. And I didn't know what was going to happen to them. So, and people avoided us for that reason. They were, they were in, in fear. And I remember one particular incident when I tried to buy some trinkets from the Kashgar uh, market and I tried to use WeChat to pay and everybody else was using WeChat. But the poor man behind the counter, he was actually only a boy, probably 15 or so. He, he was so terrified of accepting my, my WeChat. Um, he was pouring sweat beside himself. 
Um, and it suddenly, I suddenly realized, of course, he can't use a foreign person's WeChat, let, let alone a foreign journalist. So I paid in cash as well, and he breathed a sigh of relief. So um, for me, that was, um, these are things that you can't get across on TV or radio. It's, it's, a, it's an atmosphere that you can describe with words, which I try to do in my online pieces. Um, but for me, it, it was very informative and it had impact. You know, the pieces that I did for RTE, it was the first time RTE had been there for about a decade. Um, and, you know, they were brought up in the Dáil and, and the Shannon. And I was proud of that for having made, made an impact and brought the issue to the forefront of um, Irish politics at the time. Um, and then in the last question, the future of Asian journalism. I don't feel that confident about it. Um, I think that there's um, a severe lack of interest in Asia, uh, in Ireland uh, and Europe as a whole. I think if anybody's studying Asian studies, you're well ahead of the game. So uh, it's great to see. I think uh, languages are essential. I wish I'd known earlier how important it is to learn Chinese because it's been a struggle. And I would absolutely encourage anybody who's interested in going to Asia at any point in their lives to start learning the languages. Choose a country, choose a language, and just get your head down. If you are interested in China and it's difficult to get in, as we know, it's very difficult to get into China at the moment, go to Taiwan. Taiwan's opened up its borders now. It's, you don't have to quarantine for as long. You can learn uh, Chinese in, in Taiwan uh, very easily and very well. It's also an incredible place. To live <laughs> so i would recommend that that would be my advice if you're interested in in languages and then in terms of uh, the journalism for me it comes down to investment and i think the uh, european newspapers uh, broadcast outfits have taken their eye off the ball and we've suffered obviously from a funding crisis ever since i started in public service journalism i've known nothing but cuts at the bbc at rte everywhere i've worked <clears throat> so that has meant that they've had to withdraw their, their, their foreign correspondence. And so great, you know, swathes of the world have, have been left uncovered. And China is one of them. When I was, when I left China that day, I was, um, I knew that I was the last Irish journalist on the ground in China. And I felt, I felt really guilty about that. I mean, obviously we left under pressure, so it's not like I had a choice. But I think to leave China uncovered from an Irish media point of view um, is a terrible thing. It's a, it's a terrible loss. So I would hope at some point, uh, you know, media outf outfits would see that this is essential and they need to invest in it. So I'll wrap it up there. OK, thanks very much, Yvonne. And we might pick up on some of those uh, themes uh, in Q&A uh, as well. But thank you very much. And I'll hand it to David. David, I understand you may or may not have uh, some slides you want to share. So if you do. Feel free. If not, that's okay as well. Uh, and if, um, if you have questions, if you're um, uh, attending and you have questions, um, you can pop them into the Q and A, and I will then um, uh, give them to our to our panelists. Okay, David, over to you. Uh, yeah, thanks. I mean, I do have slides because I have a standard kind of self introduction. And apologies from the start for turning up in my pajamas. By the way, I'm, I think I'm the only person who's actually in Asia, and it's um, it's nine thirty, and I've just put the kids to bed and have my bath. So uh, here I am. Uh, I have a few slides. I'll try and rattle through them because they're kind of a prop as well. You know, they just help me kind of focus on on the on the three questions that you've said, Alex. Um, so just let me share the the introduction. So as I said, I'm I'm. Um, I was a full-time journalist uh, for basically for, for, for 18 years, but I, I became an academic uh, uh, two years ago, partly because I had a family and I couldn't run around the country anymore, or actually I was covering Korea as well. So I couldn't run back and forth to Korea and it was getting quite tiring. And um, uh, my wife was threatening to divorce me. That's half a joke. Uh, uh, so I usually start off with this introduction of some of the people that the stu Japanese students might know um, this is inside the uh, Fukushima power plant. And if I was to sort of jump straight forward, straight to, to the second um, question that Alex said, which is the story where I'm proudest of. I don't know if I'm proud of it, but that was definitely the, the sort of the most involved story that we all had over here. Fukushima, of course, was 2011. Uh, it was triggered by an earthquake and a tsunami. I happened to be 
the only Irish journalist on the ground here, I think basically the only, only Irish journalist uh, covering for the Irish Times, but I was also covering for the Independent at the time, which is a British newspaper. Uh, the Independent eventually sent over another correspondent um, two or three days into the disaster, but uh, basically it was me. Uh, and that story, uh, as you may recall, started off as a, a tsunami uh, and a, a, a natural disaster, a tsunami and an earthquake, but then became a story about the nuclear disaster, uh, which sort of rumbles on, if you like. Um, and one of the issues that journalists in Japan have had to deal with, I guess, is um, whether we got that story right, you know, whether we exaggerated. I mean, there's some journalists, the BBC, for example, which is now saying they, they were a little bit over the top in their coverage. Uh, this is my bio. So you can see uh, this is by way of in, sort of saying how I got into journalism. I have a sort of an unusual um, resume in that I was an academic uh, in the UK. I was a full time egghead. Uh, until 1999, and then I just got really tired of British academia, um, which, which for reasons why I won't go into, I'm sure Alex knows some of the reasons being an academic, but I just decided I was going to um, go to China, and I lived in China for, for about uh, six months. Uh, and th so I had a PhD at the time, and then I came to Japan in 2000, and I just decided that I was going to be a journalist. So like, like I was just fascinated to hear you know, the stories from uh, from Yvonne and Finbar about how they got in because I'm exactly the same. I mean, I stumbled into this profession. I really did. Uh, and uh, I was, uh, I could easily have been an academic, you know, a full-time academic. So I started stringing for the Irish Times. Uh, I actually started writing for local publications here in Tokyo, um, which I found quite easy. Uh, and the Irish Times then led to the Independent. I got the, I took over from Richard Lloyd Parry, who was the uh, correspondent for The Independent. Uh, and I covered, I was a stringer or a super stringer for The Independent from 2002 to 2016, uh, which meant lots of phone calls uh, at night from a very chaotic newspaper. You know, they would call you up uh, after their uh, editorial meeting, usually about eight o'clock, about this time actually, eight o'clock, nine o'clock uh, in the evening and asking for these stories. So uh, I don't miss that at all, I can tell you. And then I was a correspondent for the Chronicle of Higher Education. Simultaneously to that, that was a uh, more or less um, uh, full-time position from 2008 to 2016. The Chronicle covers universities across Asia. So that took me uh, to most parts of Asia, but uh, particularly to, uh, to South Korea uh, and North Korea, actually. Um, and, um, and then I was uh, uh, acting bureau chief for The Economist for two years from 2012 to 2020. Um, and then all that time when I was doing those writing jobs, I was also doing various kind of adjunct positions uh, at universities. Um, and I'm still a sort of active member of the FCCJ here in Tokyo. So I'm a member of the Professional Activities Committee, which arranges press conferences here. Uh, we just had Ai Weiwei. I was just telling Yvonne and Finbar and Alex that we had uh, Ai Weiwei today uh, at the FCCJ. Um, that's the kind of thing we try and do. We try and arrange these things. And I'm co-chair of the Freedom of the Press Committee. And then I wrote a book. So back to the sort of what, what story am I proudest of or what story took up most of my energy. Uh, I wrote a book about the Fukushima disaster called Strong in the Rain, uh, which what we did was we, we took six people who had been involved in the disaster. I think one of the things that the, one of the things we felt um, dissatisfied with afterwards was that we, we hadn't covered it in depth in any way. And what we did was we selected six people, myself and my co-author, to, to ride around the disaster. We profiled them. One was a, a worker inside the power plant. Uh, one was a fisherman, uh, a, a woman who lost her husband, um, six people in total. Um, and my, my sort of profile at the moment is um, writing for, uh, well, I write for the Irish Times. I write for the Mayanichi, which is a local newspaper. And I also... Uh, write academic papers. And this is the latest book I've been involved in Japan and the Heisei area. Um, that's my, my sort of profile, if you like. Um, if I was to sort of ask, well, the, one of the questions that Alex asked was the threats um, that we experience in Asia. And I would say that the biggest threat, and I think Finbar and Yvonne have already alluded to it, is um, financial. There's a lot of very broke journalists now, uh, even journalists who you who are very high profile and are very busy, uh, who are paid surprisingly little, you know, and, and they seem to be working harder and harder. Uh, one of my colleagues for uh, a British newspaper 
um, is paid uh, less than an English teacher here, you know, an English conversation teacher, which is just outrageous considering what he does. Um, and a lot of journalists uh, uh, no longer have bureaus, you know, they, they write from home. Uh, they write uh, sometimes from very small apartments and they're expected to do a lot more, you know, they're expected to do podcasts and uh, uh, writing and even take their own photographs. Um, and I think as, you know, the, the bigger picture, I suppose, as Finbar said is, this global threat to journalism, this global clampdown on freedom of expression, on um, you know this more authoritarian mindset which seemed to be spreading, and we had that we had a milder version of that. Of course, Japan is a bit of a beacon, isn't it, in Asia, you know, in terms of press freedom. But it's still, if you look at the RSB ranking, it's still something like seventy-one. And throughout the Abe years, the Shinzo Abe years, we had this uh, uh, quite repressive atmosphere towards journalists and. One of the things we found as foreign journalists was there was this huge uptake in trolling of foreign journalists, trolling harassment, you know, uh, uh, letters to our universities, letters, letters to our employers trying to get us kicked out of our jobs uh, from, from sort of nationalists and right wingers who didn't like what we were writing. Um, I think that would, be, that would be it. I think maybe we just leave it for questions. Will we, Alex? I think probably we've talked enough. Yeah. Sure. That sounds good. Um, so thank you all. I mean, this, these were really um, interesting remarks. Uh, we already have some questions um, coming in. So uh, I have questions myself, but maybe we'll start with the people who have been have been listening for a while. So um, the first one, uh, and I'll, I'll throw this to all of you, <clears throat> um, is sort of aside from the <laughs> just funding, more funding. Um, what do you think um, could be done to ensure Asia um, or maybe the places you're more familiar with in Asia is, is better covered for Irish uh, readers or listeners. Um, again, let's assume more funding is, is good, but what could, um, what other things do you think could, uh, could help alleviate the problem? Is, is that to anybody in particular, Alex? Or? Yeah, a, a, anybody, anybody who has thoughts on it. Um, I think it's, uh, that's, it's a very difficult question to answer. I think I would go back to expertise. I think expertise needs to be encouraged from an early stage. I think that people need to graduate from university in Ireland with some grasp of Asia and some Asia languages. Um, I would suggest first and foremost, so that's kind of starting early on. I don't think, um, I don't think Asia, Asia, Asian studies are um, embedded enough in the Irish educational system yet. I think we're still very European centric. Um, I think we look across the pond to America, but we don't look to Asia. And I think that's something that's much more kind of long term that would need, you know, political will to address in our education system. But I think that's one way forward, because if you don't, you don't have graduates coming out of the university with an interest in Asia, well, they're not going to go and cover it necessarily. So um, I, I think that would be key for me on top of the funding, as I've said. Um, and I also think, you know, I think people need to be brave enough to give it a go, like just go to Asia. If you've graduated from university, but you know, you work during the summer, you've got a bit of cash in your pocket, um, go there. You can go to China now. Um, it's obviously not, not easy to, to live there. Um, it's expensive to live in, in certainly in Japan, but also in, in other countries in Asia, but go for it, do a six week language course in, in Beijing. Um, go and get under the skin of it. That that would be one way I think of addressing the kind of the, the lack of expertise or understanding um, in the region. Yeah, something you I think all the phrase all three of you used at some point in your talk was I was the only Irish journalist fill in the blank there in Fukush there in Japan during the disaster or there in uh, in China. <laughs> at all <laughs> or the only one covering um uh, I, uh you know eu china relations so uh clearly there does have to be kind of more volume um in, in addition to language courses i would just highlight uh, one of the pathways finbar mentioned there was teaching english right so a lot of the jet program in japan or the cat program in korea or i'm sure there are others where you can kind of get some on the ground experience without having to pay for it. And in fact, with, um, you know, getting paid. Um, so uh, Finbar or David, uh, what, uh, do you have anything to add there? Oh, I mean, there was, yeah, just to mention the English teaching route. Um, there's a program here called JET, 
uh, Japan English teaching. Probably some people know it. Um, there's serious doubts about whether any Japanese children have actually learned any English from that program, but it has been the funnel for hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of you know, experts, foreign experts who've come to Japan, who've landed in these small Japanese towns uh, and who've learned very good Japanese. Uh, so you keep coming across these uh, diplomats, politicians, academics and journalists who've taken that route. Um, and I just wanted to sort of echo, by the way, Japan is not as expensive as everybody thinks. It's not as expensive as Dublin, for example. You know, I go, I go home and I'm terrified by, by Irish prices now. Um, but I just want to echo sort of Yvonne's point about expertise. Um, when I think about the people I, I read when I was growing up, they tended to be people like, um, you know, John Gittings comes to mind. I don't know if anybody remembers him from China, but he just had this really rich, you know, kind of distilled knowledge of China that only came from being there for years and really understanding how things worked. And he made China interesting. Uh, and there are journalists like that. We can all recall a few, you know, um, I don't know how people feel about Robert Fisk, but Robert Fisk always seemed to make the Middle East interesting, you know, um, and and I think that's the sort of route, if you like, is to maybe think about journalism now as as less of the sort of high paying career it was. It can be for a small number of people and more as a vocation, right? You kind of go to these places, you learn about them. You you uh, you you have to have a certain amount of curiosity. Like I'm always asked by by students, what's the what's the the key attribute to be endurance? I think it's curiosity. You know, you come to these places, and you really kind of dive deep, and you you get to know them, and then you you you're able to write about them in a really kind of a, uh, informed way. You know, I think that the model of a lot of European journalism, and I'm including the the Economist, uh, one of the more notorious cases actually is that they parachute these journalists in for for three years. They don't know anything about the place really. And by the time they know, they're they're lifted out again, you know. Um, so so that's what I'm just echoing what Yvonne said about expertise. Yeah, Inbar, you have a slightly different uh, angle because of your current beat. We don't have the excuse yeah. of Irish not being in Europe. <laughs> yeah, I I just think um, generally speaking, the coverage of Irish of Asian issues in the media is a reflection of the pro the political focus on Asia as well. I think it's ge it's generally seen as a place you can make money, like by governments ex exclusively. Um, you know, when you talk about um, China, you know, in years gone by, it's always been this land of opportunity. It's slightly changing now as you see governments probably taking a bit more of a reticent view of, of China, given all of the negative um, stories that we hear out of there. But, uh, you know, I, I think that in my experience as a political journalist here in, in Europe trying to cover Asia, um, it's generally squeezed out because, as I was saying before we started this to the other colleagues, um, because there are just more pressing issues or more neighborhood issues, and you see that reflected in the press. Um, you know, so if it's never going to be the top story, then why bother um, expending the resources on covering it properly if people aren't interested in it, which is, you know, so it's sort of one feeds the other. In this modern era of, you know, where, where journalistic uh, the media success is often measured by uh, the amount of people who read an article online or something like that. So if it's not really equating in, in, in that sort of way, rather than whatever the local scandal is in Ireland or whatever's going on with Russia or whatever, um, you know, whatever Boris Johnson is up to today. I mean, so, so it's a very negative environment in which to try and do something progressive. Um, it's and um, I, I just see from from somebody based in Brussels, where when I moved back here from Asia last year, I thought everybody would be talking about China, and nobody was. Um, and I was shocked. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I was so naive, you know. I thought, oh my god, everybody's going to want to talk to me. Um, but no. <laughs> um, but but you know, it's uh, so that was a bit of a, a rude awakening. Uh, and I, I I think generally, I don't know how you can get to a point where there's more to answer the question where there's better or more in depth coverage of Asia when a there's political disinterest and b that's because people are, and, and in newsrooms people don't see the the value. I mean, you can argue with how that value is measured. And I do think like obviously the likes of The Economist, as David measures, uh, mentioned, has a very good dedicated section for, for Asia in every issue. You know, FT has bureau and so on. But 
I think that's what you're fighting against in this modern uh, time. So it's, it's impossible to extrapolate it from the funding question because, uh, you know, that at the end of the day governs, <laughs> governs everything, unfortunately. Okay, we have, I, I suppose, kind of a related question um, that there seems to be a trend of kind of media consolidation, or at least c- consumption and consolidation, where more people are getting their news from sort of agenda setting outlets, let's say New York Times, Washington Post, maybe wire services, particularly American ones. Um, what do you see as, as the issue uh, with that? What implications do you see maybe particularly uh, with regard to, to China-US relations or Japan-US relations? Um, do you think that skews the way we think and talk about um, about uh, the, these countries in, in Europe? Can I just start on that one? I, I think it's definitely a trend, but there, there's also what you see emerging as a, some, some smaller startup media, which I think is a really encouraging trend. Stuff like Rest of World, Wire China, um, who, are, who are doing some, some really good work uh, covering these stories as well. Um, so, so at the same time, we're seeing it totally skewed towards these, um, these sort of big media brands. And I would say that's also reflected in Europe in the sort of um, think tank academic space where you have a few big entities that are hoovering up a lot of the, for example, China resource. And as a journalist, that's a really negative trend because you can't just go straight to the same people every time you're writing a story like uh, you know you want to have diversity of voices and unfortunately that's lacking um, in, in Europe at the moment but I suppose um, one negative to come out of of that is that it's hard to I suppose get it yeah in, in the media as well it's hard to get a diversity of voices if if everything is sort of veering towards if everything in the mainstream is veering towards those very big news organizations um, yeah. <laughs> Should I come in on that? Yes, go ahead, Ivan or David. Anything, anything to add? Yeah, I think um, I think it's it's definitely an issue. And uh, honestly, we sound like stuck records at this point. But that's also funding. Like, who's got the money? The New York Times has money. The Washington Post has money. You know, we don't have any money, <laughs> so we can't send people to the region. It really is as simple as that. And the same goes, I, you know, you speak to people in the Irish media as well, would love to go out to, to China, but no, the, the register isn't going to, to send them. Uh, there's not enough um, resources in, in the newsroom. So that's, that's one thing. Um, but I think Finbar's right. There are smaller outfits coming up now that are accessible via the internet that are really giving the big guys a run for their money. Um, But one thing I would say about uh, the the big, you know, established media uh, here, especially in the the US, they've invested in their China coverage in a a massive way. They've recruited um, like excellent journalists from Asia, Um, people often with, you know, uh, Chinese backgrounds. um, And they have opened newsrooms in South Korea and Taiwan because they can't get visas to get into China. So they're covering the region in a very holistic way. And that's a model, I think, that's a really good um, example of how you can cover China if you can't get in. Um, But again, you know, that that requires resources. Um, But I would, and The Economist actually, David, as well, I think The Economist's coverage of China is is phenomenal. Obviously, you know, uh, that they do have a bureau in Beijing still, they have managed to, to hang on in there. Um, but they also have people based in Hong Kong, in Taiwan, in South Korea as well. So they, they're able to create these extremely comprehensive reports about the region because they have uh, you know, this amalgamation of expertise from, from loads of different people. Whereas for me, I was you know, a one woman band in Beijing. I was just me and I was working from my front room. Um, and that's, it's, that's a very difficult model. Um, and I think it's a, a, how a lot of news operations are now operating. Um, it's a lot of pressure on journalists and I think it's uh, not necessarily the way to go. So, um, and one, one last thing I would mention, what's amazing about covering Asia is the collaboration amongst journalists. You don't, you don't feel that in other, uh, in other places, like certainly not in the US, certainly not in, in London. I don't know what Brussels li- is like, but you in Asia, it's almost like we're all in this together and we help each other. 
And I think that's a really, um, I think that's that's kind of very gratifying. It definitely was the case in, in Beijing. I'd be interested to know if you guys felt the same. But um, a lot of sharing of expertise, a lot of sharing of, of knowledge. And I think that's a really positive aspect of, of Asia coverage. Well, just if if just to address that a point about the economist, yeah, I mean it is a, it is a, uh, true that there is this kind of economist brain, isn't there? There's a whole bunch of people who've been you know in the economist for for decades, and a lot of them have rotated through Asia. Um, but but I think the, the one of the secrets of the econ like why is the economist the exceptional? Why is it one of the exceptions that it can actually have um, correspondence throughout Asia in uh, well-funded bureaus? You know, we had a uh, an office in the center of Tokyo. Um, and we had a, a secretary and a fact checker and, you know, all of the sort of the paraphernalia of these old bureaus, right? The economist has managed to hang on to that. And I, and I think one of the reasons is because obviously apart from its readership, <laughs> which addresses, you know, there's a certain kind of clientele for the, for the publication. But I, but I do think one of the reasons for the economist's success is they take reporting very seriously uh, and they, um, they spend an awful lot of time and money on fact checking you know, just making sure everything is right. Not perhaps every, to everybody's ideological taste, but just that sort of basic idea of we're reporters, we're on the ground, we're going to write a story, we're going to get it right, you know. Uh, and that's a model, it's a very expensive model, but it is a model that you can see works with The Economist. I mean, The Economist um, is, is a brand which people go to because they trust it. And it's kind of always, always shocked me how many Japanese people had subscriptions for the economist, you know, but, but I, I mean, this is a huge question about um, how do we pay for news gathering and so on in the age of the internet, it, it's, it's much more than we can, we can really handle in a format like this. I mean, it's true that some of the American bureaus do spend a lot of money here. Um, but it's also true that the pressures of um, paying for that, outlay mean that they cover Japan or Asia in a particular way like the, the CNN correspondents for example um, get a lot of a lot of criticism in Japan probably in other parts of Asia as well for for sensationalizing things for uh, for for you know skimming the surface of things for covering stories in a particular way which does which which a lot of people on the ground don't agree with and I think the internet is is obviously changing the way everything works you know I mean, there's, there's just a lot of people here who have um, enormous readerships uh, who who blog essentially from from Japan. I mean, some of them have bigger bigger readerships than the Japan Times, the Mainichi, the Japan News, the big English language newspapers here. Some people have 50, 60, 70 thousand followers, you know, more. Um, uh, it's a it's a really major, you know. That's that's the point about when we talk about this. It's such a moving picture. It's very hard to. To sort of get a hold of and we're all in a sense i hope nobody objects to the term but we're all dinosaurs you know we, we came out of this sort of industry where they they put you they put you in these foreign countries and they paid for an office and they paid for a secretary or a, a translator and um, uh, the expectation was that the the readership for the for, for those bureaus would pay for that and that that expectation is not there anymore for a lot of papers you know i'm talking about newspapers mainly of course Okay, I think we have time for one more round, of, uh, one more question for, for everybody. And I want to take the prerogative and shift gears a little bit and uh, ask you uh, if you're comfortable with it for your early thoughts or initial reactions to the biggest story in Asia in the last week, which is the Party Congress and any uh, changes or continuities that you see kind of maybe maybe from where, where you all sit. I mean, um, uh, you know, Japan-China relations or uh, Yvonne, you know, I know you've been um, uh, covering uh, Xinjiang and now you're, you uh, are in New York and so I have a different perspective and Finbar, you're on the uh, EU-China uh, uh, beat. So we've had this, some quite dramatic scenes actually from, from Beijing, which is unusual for these sorts of things. Um, and so, yeah, any, any initial thoughts? And then if we have time, I'll ask you for what project you're working on now or, or what uh, what we might be be expecting from you in the, in the near term future uh, but if we don't get to that uh, that's okay um, but so who wants to start with um, explaining what happened in Beijing I can start quickly on this one um, it reminds me of um, 
Well, last week we had the European Council meeting uh, in Brussels, and it was the first time that the European Union leaders had uh, leaders of the member states had discussed China for a full year. And that to me was kind of ridiculous, but they were. Uh, it kind of also struck me as insane that they would have it right at the same time as the as the Communist Party Congress, instead of waiting to see where the pieces fell. Um, but it reminded me of. Um, in the summer last of this year, a lot of the diplomats from Beijing came back um, to Brussels for their for their summer holidays, and they told me that they were going around um, slapping people's faces in the various directorate generals of the European Union because they were wishing that the China that exists was a China that they wanted to exist rather than China that they were seeing on the ground. Um, I think what we've seen over the past week and yesterday in particular, when we see the you know the names of the people who have been put in the Politburo and so on, is that the China that is going to be for the next five or 10 years is not the China that the West necessarily wants. It's not the China that policymakers have been trying to wish onto, you know, the China that is there. I think that's big for the European Union because they still believe in some way that they can, they can change China. There's a sort of a heady cocktail of uh, naivety, arrogance and greed here in Brussels where they sort of think, in terms of naivety, that China needs us as much as we need China. Um, and they're thinking purely in economic terms, as, as large parts of, of the European Union policymaking uh, apparatus does. I, I just don't think that that seems to be a priority, uh, number one. Control seems to be number one, and that's what we've seen from what's come out over the past week. I think that there's a level of um, yeah, the, the, the arrogance to think that they can change China and so on. I, so I, I hope that policymakers in Brussels have watched what's happened and I hope that maybe they're digesting that and that it will inform policy towards China going forward. Not very optimistic on that front. We've got Olaf Schultz going to China with a big business delegation next week or the week after. Uh, that was a big bone of contention last week at the European Council meeting where I was managed to ask some questions to prime ministers from the Baltic states and they were all very upset about this of course. Um, so, so my takeaway is that the China which has uh, emerged and which has sort of to the, to the detriment of, of its relations with the West in terms of its human rights record, in terms of its zero COVID policy, in terms of its inward looking economic model seems to be here to stay. And for those people who were slapping the faces of their colleagues back in Brussels last summer, maybe finally they'll be listened to now. Um, maybe the penny will drop, but we'll see about that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yvonne, you want to go next? Yeah, um, it's the penny dropped a long time ago in, in Washington, so the picture is different here. I think that there's a strong feeling on both sides of the political divide that China is an existential threat. They is, there's a fear that America is losing its uh, preeminence, particularly in technology. They're not wrong about that. I mean, anybody who's spent in, in any time in China will know how advanced it is and how technologically advanced it is, I think um, there's a real feeling here that they've taken their eye off the ball. They farmed out all of their supply chains, uh, leaving them exposed to, you know, uh, a risk of those supply chains being compromised in the event of, of conflict or even before. Um, there's even, uh, you know, top military personnel here warning that China could take Taiwan faster than we imagined as, as soon as this year. So that's how people are talking here. I mean, it's a completely different picture. They, they see it as we've got to act now. And I think that's why you're seeing, you know, the, the, the moves that Biden's making against uh, China's technology sector being really quite widely supported, uh, even amongst his political enemies. So I think that it is, it is quite interesting. And I think that there's, um, there's definitely uh, the golden era died a long time ago. I think the era of, of cooperation and engagement has gone. Obviously, the business lobby is still uh, very keen to maintain relations with China. They're, they continue to make money out of it, but they are losing the battle now um, when it comes to the, the hawks in Washington. They, they kind of taken over on the China issue. So that's a change in the past few years, I would say, since the Trump era. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, David, you get uh, the second to last word. 
Well, we, we just had, as I think I said at the start, we had Ai Weiwei today at the FCCJ. And um, one of my questions to him was, uh, do you think that conflict between China and the West can be avoided or is it inevitable? And he said, I think it's inevitable, which is a very depressing uh, answer. Um, you know, from Japan, the perspective from Japan, I suppose is everybody thinks Japan and China have been at each other's throats for most of the last 67 years, but they really haven't. I mean, there's a very strong kind of trade relationship between the two countries. Um, and if you did surveys in the 80s, you know, between um, if you ask Japanese people their, their favorite country in the world, they would actually say China and Chinese people said the same thing. And, and since I've been here in the last 15, 20 years, especially the last 10 years, the really dramatic change has been the change in sentiment, popular sentiment, uh, among more ordinary Japanese people uh, towards China, you know, it, it, it's almost like um, um, it's catching up with the rest of the world. And, and uh, Hong Kong, what's happened in Hong Kong has, has really kind of dramatically accelerated that sentiment. I mean, people have looked at alarm at the, uh, you know, at the clampdown on freedoms. Actually, I was just thinking when Finbar was talking, because Finbar is from Fermana, there was a, uh, a Monaghan man, I'm from Monaghan, there was a, a Monaghan journalist in Hong Kong uh, Aaron McNichols, who was kicked out uh, of the country, or he was refused a visa, uh, a journalist last year, and and that's all too common, you know. So so, um, and then of course you had these uh, uh, increasingly kind of um, um, explicit comments from Japanese, normally very wary Japanese politi politicians about uh, the dangers of Taiwan. Taiwan seems to be some kind of red line for politicians who've tolerated a lot more. So so it is a bit of a depressing picture here. I think you know. Um, and and uh, the scenes at the conference didn't help. So on that note of, <laughs> of it being a very depressing picture uh, with uh, with potentially no way out, uh, I think we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, guys, thank you very much for for your time. Uh, for those of you who are still uh, on on the webinar, I would encourage you to follow the writings of uh, and the reporting of uh, Finbar, Ivan, and David because uh, they they really know the region and they know um, they know what they're doing and they know what they're talking about. So they're uh, when I always learn something when I'm when I'm reading or listening to uh, to their writings, and uh, I, I appreciate that uh, you all have taken the time to uh, to join us. So uh, thank you and uh, good morning to you, Ivan. Good night. To you, David and Finbar, uh, have a good lunch. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thanks Thank for having us. Thank you all. Thank you.